dead. And we know that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are present among them. And so we know by faith that you are here tonight among us. And we ask you, Lord, to extend your hands on these Bibles, your written word, and on the crucifix, the greatest sign of your love for us, a sacramental. And by the grace of your spirit, bless them, Lord and make them alive. And more than that, open our hearts and stir up a hunger for your word and help us to see you, to see you on your crucifix, Lord, so that to understand how much you loved us, that you were willing to die this horrible death for each and every one of us on the cross. So bless this, these Bibles and these crucifixes the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And Lord God, we thank you that once again you have invited us this evening to come together to learn about the faith we want to adhere to, we want to deepen our knowledge about, Lord. But it's not about getting information and filling our brains with information. It's about, Lord, learning how to give our lives to you who have loved us so much. So give us hunger, intellectual hunger, spiritual hunger for you, Lord, and for anything that concerns you because you are the source of all love. You are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The mystery of unfathomable love. And we thank you that you have gathered us this evening Open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, to see you and hear you, your voice in our hearts as you give me speech to speak about the great mysteries of the faith. And this evening especially about the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God and our Mother. As we come to you through her, saying together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So next Thursday, if you have all of you got rosaries, this is the rosary that my mother gave me. She got it from Rome. And uh, so you can have. Uh, beautiful rosary, any kind of rosary, when it's blessed, it becomes a sign, a living sign of God's love, a sacramental, we call that. So, today, I am so privileged to talk about the one who um, gave us Jesus, who said yes to the Archangel Gabriel, and it is through her Salvation of all the world depended on her yes. And she said yes. She said, be it done to me according to your word. Now, she didn't say a blind yes. She questioned the angel. She said, well, I'm a virgin. You know, I know no man. So she is also, she used her brain. She used her mind. She was an intelligent woman. But she was mostly woman of faith and it is through her and it's because of her yes that tonight we're here so we're going to speak uh, about her this evening not so much about dogmas and doctrines we're going to touch on these but we're going to learn how to know her and through her know her son and through her know the Holy Spirit and through her, know the Father. So she's not only the mother of Jesus, God made man, so we call her mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus. But she, our Catholic tradition has called her also the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Because when she said yes to the angel Gabriel in the Gospel of Luke, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, overshadowed her 
and filled her to overflowing, and she became pregnant without human seed. She became pregnant of Jesus, the eternal word, the son, the eternal son of the father, who became, uh, who became, a, who grew in her womb for nine months. And, you know, she felt him. She probably talked to him while he, he was in her womb, especially when her belly started to become inflated. So she touched. And with Joseph, Joseph, her chaste spouse, you know, they vowed together not to have sexual intercourse. They vowed together to be, to be together and to be parents and of this child who is the Son of God. And this is why we call them the Holy Family. Now, the Holy Family because, not because, uh, first and foremost, they didn't have sexual intercourse together, because uh, they're unique. I mean, I, there are couples throughout the history of the church. I know one, you know, one couple who, when they got married, although both of them were capable of having children, said no. We're going to live with each other as brother and sister because we're going to consecrate our whole uh, gifts to the church. And so there are cases in the history of the church where husband and wife are live as, hus as brother and sister, but because they want to really devote their whole lives to Christ. But they're rare. Most of married couples do have sexual intercourse. And it's holy. It can be holy. So the holy family were holy, not first and foremost because they didn't have sex, as if sex is dirty. Sex is not dirty, especially that God has created us as sexual beings. And as married men and women, you know, it is a wonderful thing to love, you know, husband and wife love one another so fully that the sexual intimacy, when it's so filled with real love, can become a symbol, a sacrament of the love of Christ to his uh, bride, the church, Jesus as the bridegroom. So they are called holy first and foremost because they had so much love towards each other and toward that son that God had given them, the one who was going to be the savior of the world. And so we t talk about family virtues. They live the familial virtues, the virtues of sacrifice, the virtues of love, the virtues of generosity, of patience. They live that perfectly together. And so this is why we call them holy family first and foremost. And we still hold them as a model for every family. So, Mary, Mary, uh, we know that she was a descendant of David, you know, so she came from that line. And so, uh, because it was prophesied that her son Jesus would be the son of David, that is, a descendant of David. So, Mary, in the church, uh, outlived her son, you know, she lived beyond her son. We know that Jesus, you know, Pope Benedict the thir uh, 16 have just published a third, the third volume of his writings uh, on Jesus of Nazareth. And the third volume, actually, I, I ordered it yesterday and I, I downloaded it as a Kindle book from Amazon. So I have it in my, in my iPod, on my iPod. So it talks about the infancy about the period where Jesus was an infant. So obviously, he, I haven't read it yet, you know, he's, he's, he's speaking about the Holy Family, about Joseph, about Mary, and about baby Jesus and the infant Jesus. So Mary was first known in, in the Gospel of Luke. The, the Gospel of Luke is the Gospel that speaks uh, very much about Mary. I mean, all the Gospels speak about Mary, 
the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. You know that John, when he speaks about Mary as Mary and Jesus were invited to a wedding and at Cana, and she was, I guess, the 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 the, the, the wedding party had asked Mary to be uh, uh, their maitre d', you know, the one who takes care of, of uh, making sure that everything was okay. And Mary noticed very quickly uh, that they, they are running out of, of wine, and it was unbelievable, you know, for a wedding banquet, a Jewish wedding banquet, you know, the wedding uh, among the Jews lasts one week. Can you imagine? I don't know how long was it lasted your wedding, both of you. Did it last one week? Festivities, wine, you know, partying, and anyways, in the Jew, but among the Jews, it's a whole week of celebration. So they they have to have a lot of wine without getting drunk. You know, you can get lightheaded, but not drunk. And so uh, they they lacked wine. They they. Wine ran out, so she said, they, they don't have wine anymore. So he turns to her, he, she says, you know, what have you to do with me? My, my mission is not yet started, my time is not yet there. So as a good Jewish mother, you know, <laughs> as she, she looked at the servant, she said, do whatever he tells you. And by saying this, she kind of uh, motherly, twisted the arms of Jesus, you know, and Jesus brought, you know, had the servants fill huge jars, you know, they, those jars, every jar could contain up to 10 or 15 gallons, and huge jars, they were more than seven, I think, huge jars, fill them with water, and then the, the maitre d', the, the the, the one who was, uh, who was in charge of, of, uh, of the, I guess, the wine, went and tasted the wine. And he went to the bridegroom, he says, everybody starts with the wine of lesser quality. And then when people get uh, with the wine of, of uh, uh, good quality, when the, when the people get a little bit lightheaded, we serve them the wine of lesser quality. But you started with with the wine of with good quality wine, you know, with the so this is anyway. So I think the most important message here is that through Mary, through we could start by saying intercession. Intercession means that Mary stood between the people and her son, and she said, "See, they lack." They need something. Do something for them. And this is what we call intercession. When we pray for others, when we pray the rosary or when we pray just for other people, family, the relatives, or friends, colleagues, or when we pray for people who are starving around the world, who are, who are being oppressed through hunger and violence, we're putting ourselves between them <coughs> And God, and we're saying to God, hear the sufferings of those and come to their help. This is what we call intercession. We kind of stand in the gap, you know, between God and men. This is what Mary does in a very beautiful and powerful way. She is there to intercede for us. She is there to tell her son, look, there is... Uh, Larry, who needs you? Anderson, who needs you? What's your, where's your name tag? Maria, who needs you? There's Tammy, there's, there's, uh, there's Ashley, there's, where's Tammy's here, I think, yeah. And there's Amelia, there's Julie, where's your name tag? And there's uh, Kathleen, there's Daniel. They need you, you know. So this is what Mary does in a very, very powerful way. Now, now we see her also in um, after the angel, you know, of course, in the Gospel of Luke, after the angel Gabriel 
the archangel, not myself, the archangel Gabriel came to see her, sent by God, you know, in a very official, very solemn mission. He appears to her. She's in Nazareth. What she's doing? She's probably praying. She's an attitude of prayer. How old was she? We don't know. 14, 15 maybe. You know. And then he tells her. Kecharitomene. Uh, this is the Greek. Kecharitomene. Maria. It means you who are filled to overflowing with grace. Chaire. Rejoice. Rejoice. You know, so we translate it by Hail Mary. You know, it's, you know, um, unfortunately some Protestant Bibles say, well, you favored one. You know, it's, it's just bland. The Greek is much more than this. It means rejoice, O who highly filled with the grace of God. And so, you know, she was kind of taken aback, surprised, and, and he says, you know, he tells her that the Lord, you know, wants to, has chosen her to, for her to become the mother of the Son of God. And so the whole of creation, as some saints tell us, Saint Bernard, says the whole creation is waiting for Mary to say yes. And after a few interactions with the angels, she says, Behold, let it be done unto me according to your word. A perfect obedience of faith. And it's through her yes of faith. In Latin, we call it fiat. Fiat means let it be done in Latin. So through her perfect response, obedience of faith, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and the Son of God became, you know, entered into her womb. And so became, a, I would say, you know, he, he went through the stages of human development, nine months, you know. And so as very soon after she became pregnant with the Son of God, and um, of course Joseph, Joseph had to be told because Joseph may have thought that, oh, Mary, her beloved, his beloved one may have gone to see another man. So the angel appeared to him in his dreams and fear not, Joseph, because the one that Mary is carrying in her womb is the Son of God. So uh, Joseph was again his fears were gone and he accepted fully to be the foster father of Jesus so as soon as Mary knew um, she became you know the mother of the Son of God the mother of God we'll talk about this later the Holy Spirit who filled her so much reminded her that her old cousin Elizabeth who was barren, who couldn't get any, you know, who couldn't be uh, barren probably. She had either, she couldn't be, get pregnant or she had constant miscarriages, we don't know. That her older cousin Elizabeth, probably in her 60s, late 60s, we don't know, you know, uh, was pregnant six months, six months pregnant. And so the Holy Spirit prompted Mary to go and serve her cousin for three months until baby John the Baptist was born, the cousin of Jesus. And this fascinating scene of the visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth, it's absolutely fascinating because it reminds me of many of the Jewish feasts uh, that is called Simcha Torah. Torah is in, in, in Hebrew. I've told you this. The Torah is the five books of the Bible. Can somebody list them to me? What are the first five books of the Bibles in their proper order? 
Larry. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Absolutely wonderful. So next week I'm going to quiz each one of you. <laughs> so you better know that. Otherwise, you'll get a D minus. <laughs> Not a failing grade, but a D minus. Anyways, so she, that in this Jewish feast, which lasts again one week, they carry the, the rabbis and, and the Jewish faithful. You know, they have this the five books of the Bible, the first five books in a scroll, in a scroll. They have a a sort of a container that looks like a scroll with two handles and with, you know, surrounded by beautiful velvety decorated carpet, you know. And they, what they do is that they just hold it up and then the rabbis, they jump with joy and it's a very beautiful, joyous celebration. Now why does it remind me of the visitation? Because Mary, bearing the Son of God, you know, Mary reminds you of, the, in the Old Testament, the, uh, the Ten Commandments uh, were carried in a container, very holy, uh, called the Ark of the Covenant. And so, remember when David brought the Ark of the Covenant from the Old Temple of Silo to Jerusalem, David, while the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant in a sort of a box like our tabernacle, he jumped with joy. He was shouting with joy. And the whole people were extremely ecstatic and joyful because the presence of God was coming in this Ark of the Covenant. And so Mary, as soon as she enters the house of Elizabeth, her cousin, nobody has told Elizabeth that her young cousin Mary was pregnant. As soon as she enters, Elizabeth and the baby she was carrying, you know, six months, John the Baptist, were filled with the Holy Spirit and they jumped with joy and Elizabeth exclaimed, how can I be so privileged that the mother of my Lord would come and visit me. How did she know? The word Lord in the Old Testament means God. Adonai, Yahweh, you know, the word Lord. How come that the mother of my God comes to visit me? You know, and then she said, Behold, uh, blessed is she. She's talking about Mary. Blessed is she who believed the word that was told to her. All of a sudden, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, which filled uh, Elizabeth and John the Baptist, he was leaping, 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 and, uh, and she's imagined as 60 years old with, with her, with her um, you know, baby in her womb, leaping, leaping, leaping. She was, and she has become a prophet, you know. She, know, she knew that her cousin was carrying God. And then the beautiful thing of the response of Mary. She just, it was an explosion of joy and praise. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And the, the word is exalts. It's more than joy. You know, it's just jumping with joy. For he was, he has looked on the lowliness of his maid servant. And she, she was so humble, this Mary. You know, sometimes when we look at her, we think that she is, you know, uh, glory, glorious that she is. But her glory is the glory of her humility. You know, how she said, he has looked on the lowliness of his maid servant from now on. All generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And you know, when hopefully one day I get to heaven, I'll ask Mary and Elizabeth, what did you do during this scene? Because I can imagine them hugging their, each other and jumping with joy. 
You know, John the Baptist, in the womb of his elderly mother, bowing before Jesus, his cousin, in the womb of Mary, and both of them holding each other and jumping with joy. So that's an absolutely wonderful scene. So we know that Mary went there, served her cousin for three months, and then returned. And we know the, the rest of the story. You know, as they were going, Mary and Joseph, Mary was nine months uh, to, uh, for the Passover in, uh, in Jerusalem. They stopped. You know, there were so many pilgrims probably going to, the, to Jerusalem from all over Palestine that there was no room anywhere. You know, at that time there was no Hilton, there was no, you know, uh, no five-star hotels. So all of them were closed, I mean, full, full house. And so there was no room in the inn. And probably, you know, by uh, not too far in the village of Bethlehem, in some outskirts of Bethlehem in a grotto, you know, somebody had indicated, well, there's a, there's a cave, go there, you know. And so she, they went there, and this is how baby Jesus was born. Yeah. And so we know all this. Uh, I don't need to rehash that with you. Well, what we know is that Mary, um, at the age of 12, when they lost Jesus again, huh? now, the first time they went to the Jerusalem because there was a census, but at the age of 12, when they went to Jerusalem, it was because of the Passover. They wanted to go to Jerusalem. And so they lost Jesus because probably they were part of a caravan of a you know, many, many people going there, you know, and then, so they had friends and relatives, they were talking with them, and they thought that Jesus, who was 12 at that time, was part of this, and they realized that he was not there, so they got a little bit panicky, and on the third day, they had to return to Jerusalem for three days, they found him talking with the scholars, you know, with the experts of the of the law of Moses, and they were fascinated at the wisdom and the intelligence of this young boy of 12 years old. And so Mary tells Jesus, but don't you know, Jesus, that your father and myself were really very afraid, you know? So he turns to his mother and father, he says, well, don't you know that I'm, I am always, I have to be with my father's business? And so they probably didn't get it, you know, right away. But later on, as he returned with them, and he grew in, in wisdom and grace, but Mary kept pondering, you know, that means, you know, thinking and praying about all the words of Jesus and what Jesus was doing. And this is where Mary is for us a model of prayer, you know. Uh, Mary is for us the one who intercedes for us, but the one who, who looks at the event around in the world, the event of her life, the event of Jesus, and tries with, with the grace of God to make sense out of them. What is God trying to tell me as Mary? You know, we know that We'll touch about this, that Mary was Immaculate Conception, but that doesn't mean that she knew everything, you know. She had to learn. She had to grow in, the, in knowledge and wisdom, Mary, although she was Immaculate Conception. So, and then we see Jesus starting his ministry, of course. And uh, the Gospel of John tells us that Mary was at the foot of the cross. All of his disciples had fled, you know, except one, the youngest one, John, who was with Mary at the foot of the cross, and two or three other Marys, I think two other Marys, certainly Mary Magdalene, and another Mary who tradition says could be uh, a sister of Mary, a younger sister of Mary. So, um, or she could be a cousin of Mary. And she was married to a man called Cleopas. Uh, and one of her sons, Jude, uh, was among 
the disciples. Anyways, so this is where we see Mary. Now, next, the next place we see Mary is Jesus is already risen from the dead. He had stayed 40 days with his apostles. 500 people have seen Jesus, have heard him speak, have touched him. The apostles have eaten with him. He was already risen from the dead. And he could go through walls, through locked doors. He could appear there, not as a ghost, but a true human being. But the laws of gravitation, the laws of that we know, he was beyond that. And that tells us that one day, God willing, when we will be one day risen from the dead, that with our glorious body, it will be a true human body, but it will be like the body of Jesus. That is, the law of, of uh, gravitation will not apply, you know. So, so Jesus was there for 40 days with his apostles, and then he took them outside of Jerusalem, and he says, now I have to leave, because if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit will not come will not come. And when he, would, when he comes, the advocate or the paraclete in, Greece, in Greek, parakletos, which means the advocate, the defender, you know, the comforter, the consoler. When he comes, he will bring to your memory everything that I've told you and he will lead you into all truth. And so the you know, the Acts of the Apostle says that there were about 500 people when Jesus took all his disciples and, uh, and he, was, he vanished from among them, you know. And this was the day of his ascension into heaven, the 40 days after he was risen from the dead. So Mary was probably with him now with all this, but we don't know. What we know is that the Acts of the Apostle tells us that Jesus, before he left, he, stayed, he said to his apostles and disciples, wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Wait that you will be um, clothed with power from on high. Wait until the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, will come. And so while they were waiting, Jesus had gone. Mary was among them. In this upper room, now we must be, must have been as maybe large as this room here, but this room is a basement room. The other meeting room where Jesus had, you know, established the Eucharist, you know, when he uh, took bread and then said, give, gave thanks and said, this is my body. And when he took wine and gave thanks to God and said, this is my blood. And he, so he established the Eucharist, the Mass. He, his disciples, his apostles, the 12 men, became the official priests. You know, this is the feast of ordination. And then this was the same room where up to 120 men and women were gathered waiting for the Holy Spirit. So after the, on the 40th day of Jesus rising from the dead, he ascended into heaven, he vanished. He said to his disciples, wait to receive the Holy Spirit. They waited with Mary. And Mary was among them. And I can imagine Mary as the mother of Jesus. Like Jesus probably was about between 30 and 33. And Mary was maybe 16, at 16 to 30 or 33. So Mary was about 50, 50 years. She was there. And they knew that she was the mother of Jesus. And they loved her. She was in the middle of the, in the midst of them with other women, holy women. And they prayed for nine days, 40 plus nine. And Mary was among them. And that was the first novena, when we Catholics pray for nine days with Mary, we call it a novena. That was the first novena. And after they finished 
nine days of prayer. On the tenth day, which was 10 plus 40, the 50th day of Jesus' resurrection, it was the Feast of Pentecost. All of a sudden, as we know, ooh, mighty wind, my sound of a mighty rushing wind came in. And all of them, can you imagine Mary, had some flames, tongues of fire coming on from each one of them. And they started praying and praising God with, in a heavenly language, that all the thousands of pilgrims who were there in the marketplace, you know, uh, for the feast, Jewish Feast of Pentecost, heard them speaking, the, declaring the praises of God in their own languages. And you can imagine Mary, the first one who had accepted, received the fullness of the Holy Spirit on the day of the Annunciation when Gabriel the Archangel came to see her. She was like a magnet. She was the one who whoo, attracted the Holy Spirit. And so this is why we love Mary. When Mary is part and parcel of our prayer, of our faith life, we can be sure that Jesus is there, that the Holy Spirit is there, and that the Father is there. So Mary is like a magnet that intercedes, prays for us, that brings us to a closer union to Jesus, her son, that, you know, calls on the Holy Spirit to fill us and give us this desire to be witnesses of Jesus and to live and evangelize, to be an evangelizer, you know. And Mary teaches us how to pray to the Father. So, we know that Mary was there. Now, after that, we don't know what happened. Scripture, the Bible becomes silent about Mary. Except that we Catholics, we have, as we know, sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Sacred tradition is made of the many, many oral traditions that were given to the apostles by Jesus. You know, not everything was written. As I told you before, the last chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, says that if we had to write everything that Jesus said or did, we would need all the books of the world to do this. So there were oral traditions that became part of these sacred traditions. Now what this sacred tradition tell us, there are two traditions. That after Mary was given on the foot of the cross, Jesus in the Gospel of John turns to Mary and she in his agony tells her, Behold your son. And he turns to John and he tells him, Behold your mother. So what Jesus did is give Mary to John. Entrust John, the only apostle who, who didn't flee, who didn't, uh, he entrusted Mary to the faithful apostle John. And the faithful apostle John symbolizes the whole church. And therefore, Mary being entrusted to John, being the mother, called the mother of John, she becomes the mother of all of us believers. She's the mother of the church. So one tradition says that Mary took her, uh, that John took Mary with him, and he lived with him. Now John stayed probably a few years in Jerusalem, but then he preached in what is now present-day Turkey. And he had a house in one of the city, one of the towns in Turkey called Ephesus. So he took her to Ephesus, and this is where Mary stayed with John in that little house of Ephesus. If you go to Turkey right now, you can go, and there are lots of pilgrims who go to the house of Mary in Ephesus. You know, so there's that tradition. There's the other tradition that says that Mary died in Jerusalem. 
However, as we know from sacred tradition, the oral tradition is that as soon as Mary died, they didn't find her body. Her body was gone. And the conviction was known throughout the church that Jesus Christ himself came to take Mary with him in glory. Now, he didn't take his, her soul only. Like when we die, our soul is separated from our body and our soul is, faces particular judgment. And if, if, if we lived perfectly love, the call of love, the call of the gospel, you know, we're immediately, you know, we go to heaven. But for most of us, we need to be purified in purgatory. So, but Jesus did not only take the soul of Mary with him in glory, he took her body and soul. And we call this assumption. And assumption of Mary means her resurrection. Jesus took her. And the oldest traditions say that Mary died, but Jesus rose her from the dead, and he took her body and soul with him. So Mary is the forerunner, the one who is precedes us in glory, because we are called to be, uh, through our the depth of the love of Christ in our lives, we're called also one day in hope to rise from the dead. Mary precedes us. Now, she was sinless. She was the Immaculate Mother of Jesus, and she lived her call fully. And so, he, she, Mary, who was worthy to bring, to carry in her flesh the Son of God, Mary, who was the mother uh, a model of faith first said, Be it done to me according to your word, who obeyed and who, who was filled with faith, was taken up to heaven with her son. Now, what is she doing there? Well, very early in the Catholic tradition, one I you know I studied the, what we call the early church fathers, those authors who in the first five centuries, they were, some of them were, were bishops, some of them were lay people who wrote books and preached. They're called church fathers. The early, the earliest uh, trace of Mary appearing, you know, we've all heard about the apparitions of Mary and Lourdes, Fatima and elsewhere, you know, especially those recognized apparitions. One of the early church fathers whom I studied personally, St. Gregory of Nyssa, who lived in the fourth century, late fourth century, he says that his great grandparents uh, knew about one uh, man who became the one who evangelized Turkey, you know, the one who was really uh, preached and founded a lot of churches in Turkey in the third century. His name was Gregory, and he was known as a wonder worker. St. Gregory the wonder worker. He fell ill, and he was about to die. He was so ill. We don't know exactly what kind of illness. It could have been hemorrhaging. It could have been all kind of illnesses. He felt he, everybody was, was, the doctor said he's dying. And he felt like dying. And all of a sudden, in, we know that the first apparition of Mary, Mary comes during the night, escorted by, by, the Apostle John and by the Archangel Gabriel. And she says to Gregory, who was so sick about to die, he said, I am going to heal you. You're going to be restored to full health. 
and keep on proclaiming the gospel of my son. And so we have the earliest trace of Mary appearing in the third century. So the apparitions when say, well, Lourdes is what? Lourdes is uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, Fatima is early 20th century. But the earliest apparition of Mary is in the third century, at least written down, you know. So Mary, what does she do? She is with her son. She prays for the church. Mary, if, you know, you probably heard we had a, uh, an exhibition about less than a year ago, or maybe six months ago, about the, the Holy Shroud of Turin. That is Jesus. Uh, but Mary appeared to the, uh, in Mexico as Our Lady of Guadalupe. And she, um, she appeared like to a peasant who was a Catholic, Juan Diego. And she, she looked like an Aztec princess. At that time, all of the Mexicans were Aztecs, you know. They hadn't yet mixed with the Spanish. And so she, and, and she says, she said to Juan Diego, go tell the bishop to, uh, to build a sanctuary for me here, this church. And so uh, he goes to tell the bishop, the bishop who was a holy Franciscan bishop, did not believe, you know, said, well, I don't, I need a sign, you know, that's truly married. So when he came, when he returned, Juan Diego, it was, I guess, winter time. I know, don't know exactly the details of the story. And all of a sudden, there was a, a, a bouquet of, of roses, you know. So he, he, she told him to pick up the roses. And also, in his, uh, uh, you know, garment, he was wearing a sort of a, a gown that was called back then tilma, you know, that the Aztec wore. In the, uh, just on the tilma was, there was the, uh, it, the, the picture of this beautiful uh, princess Aztec. And it was kind of printed on the tilma. So when he went to see the bishop, he showed him the, the roses, I think. And the bishop was stunned because at that, during that season, there's no roses. But then when he opened up, the bishop saw everything on the garment of Juan Diego, and he fell on his knees, and he worshipped God, and he built uh, a shrine, a church for, for Mary. And it is through this apparition that millions of Aztecs embraced the Catholic faith. You know that the Aztecs, what they did is they did human sacrifices. It was horrible. If uh, some of you saw the movie by, I think Mel Gibson called Apocalypto, tells you the story of how the Aztecs, when they invaded some people, they would offer them as human sacrifices from the big pyramids that you go and see in Mexico. If you go to Mexico, Chichen Itza, or Oaxaca, or Oaxaca, you know, it was horrible. And it's studies shown that every year there were more than a thousand human sacrifices. They would sacrifice babies, they would sacrifice adults. And when Mary appeared and the millions embraced Christianity, the human sacrifices was absolutely stopped, seized. That was one of the results. So Mary keeps appearing and drawing people to her son and to the church of her son. Of course, who's, who can say is this really Mary? Maybe it's the devil disguising itself into somewhat somebody like Mary. It is the church. The church who has the authority to rightly interpret the Bible has the authority also to discern if this apparition is truly Mary or if the apparition is a phony Mary. You know, So it's the church. Now it's time for us to stop and have a bite. So let us stand up and bless the food that we're going to eat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I looked up in the index, uh, Mary, of the UCAT. Do you have the UCAT? I do. From now on, please bring the UCAT with you every Thursday. So, I looked up Mary. There are uh, a few um, questions and answers about Mary. So the one, the first one, uh, is Mary, the mother of God. Let's let's see here, uh, which is question number eighty. It starts with number eighty. First, why is Mary a virgin? As I told you, for those of you who were at the last weekend mass, you know, I, I, I talked exceptionally. The whole homily was about the yucca, so that you can get to know the yucca. It's very, very, very powerful. It's very good. And it's written in a language that you can understand. I'm not saying that the big Catholic catechism is, is the reference. But, you know, this one will help you one day to read the other one. Because this one is, is very attractive. The language is simple. Lots of examples. I told you three kinds of quotes in the margins. You got a dictionary. All the complicated words and phrases are very well explained. Second, you've got quotes from the Bible, There's lots of quotes from the Bible, and related, of course, to the questions and answers. And thirdly, you've got quotes from the saints, from the popes, from lay people, very, very beautiful quotes. So, why is Mary a virgin? The answer, God willed that Jesus Christ should have a true human mother, but only God himself as his father because he wanted to make a new beginning that could be credited to him alone and not to earthly forces. So that's the answer. Now there's a comment. The comment, as I mentioned, are, you know, oftentimes the explanation of the comments contain gems, you know. It says, Mary's virginity is not some outdated mythological notion, but rather fundamental to the life of Jesus. He was born of a woman, but had no human father. Jesus Christ is a new beginning in the world that has been instituted from on high. In the Gospel of Luke, Mary asks the angel, how can this be since I have no husband? which means, I do not sleep with a man. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Although the church from the earliest days was mocked and ridiculed because of her belief in Mary's virginity, she has always believed that her virginity is real and not merely symbolic. Now there's pagan philosophers you know, if one day you read the church history, there's one early church father called Origen who, who wrote four volumes, wrote a big book against a pagan philosopher called Celsus who attacked Christianity and ridiculed Christianity. And one of the attacks is about Mary as a virgin. It says, you know, Jesus, you know, there's rumors saying that Mary was you know, was raped by a Roman soldier, and for, to cover up, cover up, she got Joseph to be with her. We know that Jesus, you know, they, he used very vulgar and violent words. Jesus, the son of Mary, was a bastard, you know. And so they ridiculed uh, Mary, but the Christian, the Catholic Church, say, well, you know, the Catholics get together on Sundays, and you know what they do? They eat babies. They eat the flesh of babies, you know, and uh, and sometimes they they before before sacrificing babies they they put 
donkey's head on them, they cover them with a donkey's head and they sacrifice them and they eat their flesh. You know, there were so many rumors and attacks against Christianity. So this early church father's origin had to answer. And, you know, by answering this philosopher, Celsus, pagan philosopher, he told us about many traditions. And he told us that Mary, as early as the second century, was called Theotokos, Mother of God, you know? She wasn't only told, you know, called Mother of Jesus, she was called already Mother of God. And then two centuries later, in a church council, Church Council of Ephesus 431, they, the church, solemnly declared that Mary is Theotokos, that means Mother of God. But that was a very early belief. So, the other thing about Mary, um, why did Mary, no, did Mary have other children besides Jesus? You know, Protestants oftentimes take the Gospel of Mark, you know, and it says, your mother and your brother. We know, we know the, this Jesus. We know his, his, his mother, we know his father, we know his brothers and sisters, and they name them. So, did Mary have other children besides Jesus? The answer, no. Because Jesus is the only son of Mary in the physical sense. Now, that's the answer. But the explanation, or the comment, even in the early church, Mary's perpetual virginity was assumed, which rules out the possibility of Jesus having brothers and sisters from the same mother. In Aramaic, which was the language of Jesus, Jesus' mother tongue, there's only one word for sibling and cousins. When the Gospels speak about the brothers and sisters of Jesus, for instance in Mark 3, 31 to 35, they are referring to Jesus' close relatives. See, in, in this language, Aramaic, there's no two words for sibling and cousins. There's only one word. And we know, you know, if you go to old countries, you know, at least in mine, in the Middle East, I come from Lebanon, born in Syria, you know, Syria is now hell. Uh, it's, you know, people are tearing each other apart. But if you go to those countries, back during the time of Jesus, they, husband and wife did not live in a, in a sort of a cellular family. They were surrounded by relatives and cousins. All of them lived close by. So they, we call them extended families. And in those countries, cousins and close relatives were called brothers and sisters. And that's where the Protestants don't understand, unfortunately. But what can we do? We can just explain to them and only faith, the grace of God, will change their heart. Uh, another question. Is, isn't it improper to call Mary the mother of God? The answer, no. Anyone who calls Mary the mother of God thereby professes that her son is God. And the explanation or the comment, as early Christianity was debating who Jesus was, the title Theotokos, which means God-bearer, mother of God, became the hallmark for the orthodox interpretation of sacred scripture. Mary did not give birth merely to a man who then, after his birth, became God. Rather, even in her womb, her child is the true Son of God. This debate is not about Mary in the first place. Rather, it's again the question of whether Jesus is true man and true God at the same time. Now, there's another question. What does the Immaculate Conception of Mary mean? And the answer is, the Church believes that the Most Blessed Virgin Mary was, from the first moment of her conception, 
by a very singular, that means special grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, Mary was preserved immune from all stain of original sin. Now that's the answer. It might sound a bit complicated. Explanation or comment. Belief in the Immaculate Conception has existed since the beginning of the church. The expression is misunderstood today. It is, Immaculate Conception is saying that God preserved Mary from original sin from the very beginning. It says nothing about the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb. By no means, Immaculate Conception, is it a devaluation of sexuality in Christianity, as though a husband and a wife would be stained if they conceived a child. It's not a matter. Mary is not immaculate because in Christianity, you know, we think that sexuality is dirty. No way. As I keep saying, as I, you know, Pope John Paul has, you know, prepared or done a whole course, the theology of the body, one day you may want to take it. It's a very powerful course just to show that, you know, our sexuality is God-given. But it is being so much misused. And that's why it leads to all sorts of problems and heartaches and brokenness. This is where, you know, sexuality is best and most beautifully expressed in married love. And when, uh, so it's not because sexuality is dirty that Mary is a man of deception. No. Was Mary only an instrument of God? And the answer is, Mary was more than a merely passive instrument of God. The incarnation of God took place through her active consent as well. Now, the explanation. When the angel Gabriel told her that she would bear the Son of God, Mary replied, let it be unto me according to your word. The redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ thus begins with a request by God and the free consent of a human being at a pregnancy before Mary was married to Joseph. You know, when Jews, the Jews, when they got married, first they were engaged. They were engaged by a contract to each other. And so when the woman and the man were engaged, sometimes it could last up to a year. That means, you know, they, they still don't have intercourse. But they don't live together yet. But they're engaged. They cannot, you know, uh, be unfaithful to each other. So when Mary, the redemption, this is beautiful, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ thus begins with a request by God and the free consent of a human being and a pregnancy, pregnancy before Mary was married to Joseph. She was only betrothed, that means engaged to, Jesus, to Joseph. By such an unusual path, Mary became for us the gate of salvation. Now next question, why is Mary our mother also? Mary is our mother because Christ the Lord gave her to us as a mother. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is crucified. John is there, and Mary is there, and the three women are there. And Jesus says to John, to Mary, woman, behold your son, and to John, behold your mother. Behold your mother. This command which Jesus spoke from the cross to John has always been understood by the church as an act of entrusting the whole church to Mary. Thus Mary is our mother too. We may call upon her and ask her to intercede with God. Now there are other 
you know, there are other questions and answers and explanations about Mary. I'll leave that to you. You can look them up in the index on Mary and find them. Now, the of course, the numbers at the index, you know, on the in, in the index here, the number refers to the question, not to the page, to the question. Now, very quickly, a history of what we call iconography. How is Mary represented? You know, as we say, how is Jesus represented? One of you sent me a, an email, a long email, <laughs> and I, my response was twice as long. Anyways, he said, why, how come different cultures represent Jesus in different ways? How come uh, different cultures represent Mary in different ways? For example, you go to China, you see Mary, Queen of China, as a Chinese woman. You go to Japan, you see Mary as a beautiful Japanese woman. You go to Mexico, you see Mary as a beautiful Aztec princess, Our Lady of Guadalupe. You go to Korea, you say the same thing. You go to, I don't know, to the Philippines, probably the, the you know, uh, the Mary has Filipino features. So you go to Africa, Mary, I don't know if she's represented as black woman, but we know in, 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 in Poland, Our Lady, one of the, uh, the most important representation of Mary is a black Madonna, Our Lady of Czestochowa, because there was a, there was a fire at that time. That, and Mary became, her face became black, but she's still being uh, venerated now. So the simple answer is, you re remember, it's not an exhaustive, it's not a full convincing answer, you know. When we see him in heaven face to face, we can ask Jesus, how come you're present this way, how come on Mary too? But one explanation is that Jesus is risen from the dead. He's capable of, of appearing to people in any way, shape, or form he wants. Remember when he appeared to the two disciples of going back home on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him. And he started questioning them, why are you so sad? Oh, you, do, you're, you must be the only one who didn't know that the one whom we've hoped so much to be the king, the Messiah, you know, has been killed and, you know, and now there's three days and some women tell us that he's alive, but, and so he, he asked them, he asked them about, you know, uh, tell them, about, and he starts to ask them questions and, and then as they get home, that stranger is walking, you know, going somewhere, and well, because of their, you know, when you go to this, these countries, there is what we call sacred hospitality. If a family invites you to come and eat with them or to stay with them, you don't dare to say no. <laughs> you know, hospitality is sacred. So this stranger who walked with them, and now it's getting dark, they told him, well, come and stay with us. So he went. And as we see in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, he took bread. Instead of, you know, a guest usually, he's, he waits for, you know, uh, the host to give him, you know, eat to eat. But he took bread, he gave thanks, and he gave them the bread. And then, all of a sudden, when he did this, he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, was not our heart uh, burning when he was on the way he was explaining to us the scriptures and they recognized him at the breaking of the bread. They knew that Jesus, their eyes were open. They didn't recognize him before. He was risen from the dead. You know when you come to eat the Eucharist, the bread of life, do you, your, your physical eyes, do, do they recognize the resurrected Jesus in this bread? They don't. True or not? Do you, your physical eyes, do they recognize, do they see Jesus in this piece of bread? No. 
because he's risen from the dead and he is fully present in this piece of bread. That's why we come to receive him in this piece of bread after consecration to receive him as God, fully God, and fully human being also. But our physical eyes, it's, it's, it's impossible. So he's risen from the dead. If he is able to give himself through a piece of bread after consecration, well, he is able to appear as an African for the, uh, for the Africans, as, a, as an Asian to the Asian, as a, as a Mexican to the Mexican. Same thing with the Blessed Mother. She is also risen from the dead. And she appears to the Aztecs in Mexico as an Aztec princess. She appears to the Chinese as a Chinese beautiful woman. She appears to the Africans probably as an African woman. So that's an answer. It might not be fully satisfactory, but that's an answer. Now, so we see that Mary, from the earliest ages of the church, there's a tradition which says that St. Luke, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, St. Luke, we know that he was a very well-educated man. He was a convert from paganism, and he was a physician. He was a doctor. But he had also another gift in his leisure time. He, he was an iconographer. He was a painter. So there's an old tradition that says St. Luke was the first one to have painted an icon of Mary. Of course, that's a tradition. Uh, among other traditions. There's another tradition who said that, you know, remember Veronica, when Jesus was being carrying the cross and going to Golgotha, there was a woman named Veronica who took her a veil and put it on the face of Jesus. And the face of Jesus was printed on her veil, the veil of Veronica. There's also that tradition that Jesus uh, Jesus' face was printed uh, miraculously on the veil of Veronica. But there is an older tradition. One of the kings during the time of Jesus, uh, around Iran now, you know, asked Jesus to come and preach the gospel in his country. And Jesus said to him, I cannot, I cannot, but I will send you one of my apostles, uh, Bartholomew to go and preach the gospel and I will give him a sign of my presence with you and so this sign was again on a piece of cloth uh, you know the face of Jesus was printed and this tradition is the tradition you can look it up the tradition of the mandilion mandilion means the veil on which was printed miraculously the face of Jesus. And there is a connection between this tradition, which is a very old tradition, and the Shroud, the Shroud of Turin. So we have representations of the face of Jesus very early on. Around the 4th and the 5th century, there was a there were traditions of Mary and Jesus painted, which we call icons. And so there's also a tradition of Jesus uh, in iconography, Jesus as the king. You know, on Sunday we celebrate the solemnity of Christ the king. If you go to Istanbul, anybody went to Istanbul, Turkey? Well, if you go to uh, one of the greatest old churches transformed now first into a mosque and then now into a museum, Hagia Sophia, Holy Saint Sophia, you will see that Jesus as the king represented. So, so this is very early, the representations of Jesus and Mary and the angels. Mary was always represented with Jesus always. And very soon,
colors became symbols. For example, red is always color of blood. You know, this is, this is uh, usually the original is red because this is a very old icon dating from the 13th century. This is not a, the original, obviously. Uh, so blue is the color of divinity. And red, as you know here, is the color of blood, passion. You know, Jesus as true God, who for love of us uh, shed his blood to redeem us and save us. So you notice here that Jesus is not represented as a baby. He's small, but he looks like a, a you know, kind of seven, eight years old, you know. He's not exactly a baby. Uh, always, most of the time, the hand of Mary and the hand of Jesus are together. And you know, he's sort of uh, hugging, his, 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 his cheeks are on the cheeks of his mother, he's, he's looking to her, and she looks to us as if she's telling us, as I'm holding the hands of Jesus, my son and my God, I want you to look at him. So icons are not paintings. True icons are, they're not called, we, we don't use the word to paint an icon, but to write an icon. Because icon, icons are words of God that are meant, originally they're meant for those who didn't know how to read and write. You know, up until I would say, I don't know, a hundred years ago, the majority of people didn't know how to read and write. And so how would they know uh, the, the, the beauty of the faith except by representations like icons? You go to different churches in Europe, the old churches, you see all the scenes of the life and death and resurrection of Mary and Jesus together. So for those who were illiterate, they would know the faith by contemplating the icons, you know. And this is this marvelous thing about the churches in Europe, you know. You go to the big cathedrals and you see um, um, stained glasses, you know, rosebuds, you know, they're wonderful, you know, all the gospel scenes, the Old Testament scenes in representations of stained glasses. And you see in very old cathedrals, the Gothic cathedrals, you see Mary as the queen seated on, on, on a throne with, with Jesus on her lap, you know. Up until the 16th century, most, I would say 99% of the representation of Mary were always with Jesus. Around the 16th century, we see a new phenomenon. Mary started to be sculpted or painted alone, not with her son. Uh, we see later apparitions, for example, in Lourdes and Fatima. Uh, Mary appears alone, but of course she says that she's the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. So. In terms of iconography, Mary has no role, has no meaning without her son. If Mary was not mother of God, mother of her son, we wouldn't look to Mary at all. But because Mary's is defined through her son that we love Mary. Now, I would like to say that, you know, sometimes through popular devotions, we can overemphasize the importance of Mary. Sometimes Mary becomes like a goddess, but Mary is not a goddess. There is, in Catholic Orthodox belief, in Catholic tradition, there is two ways of relating to God and to the saints. One way to relate to God is called, the way to relate to God is called 
Latria. Latria means worship in, in the Greek, Latria. And you recognize this word, idolatria, idolatry. Idolatry is worship of false gods. So the worship of God is Latria. Who can we worship? We worship God the Father, we worship God the Son, and we worship the Holy Spirit. Now as we know, we call the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God and three divine persons, the most blessed or the most the Holy Trinity. So we worship God the Trinity and we worship God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. As I said a few weeks ago, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are no three gods. There's one God and three divine persons united in, in a mysterious way, in a unique way. So this is the true worship. Now, how we relate to the saints, the one who were faithful from start to end to the gospel, who loved in a heroic way, is called dulia. Now, these are part of your dictionary. So, Mary is the highest the most blessed of all the saints, but she's a creature. And St. Thomas Aquinas gives her the title of hyperdulia. That means the most blessed or the most venerable of all the saints. So Mary is a creature and we have to relate to her as a creature, not as a goddess. Only God can we worship. Mary we don't worship, we venerate. There's a verb in English, venerate. We honor Mary, we venerate Mary. We never should say worship Mary. It's an abuse of language. So, Mary being a creature, albeit the most blessed, the highest of all creatures, the humblest one, she's immaculate conception, but she's not a goddess. She is hyperdulia, that means the most honorable, the most blessed of all creatures. So, in some popular devotions, sometimes there are abuses where Mary is kind of nearly worshipped and we forget her son. Mary has no meaning without Jesus. She is the servant of the Most High. She is the mother of her son, but she is the disciple, the servant of her son, who is God. Now Mary has the honor of being the mother of God, but she's not a goddess. She's like a queen mother, you know? The queen mother has influence on her son, but her son is the king. You know, so that should be very clear. So, as I said, we see, in especially the Western Church, the Catholic Church in the West, Mary from the 16th century on represented mostly alone. Whereas in the Eastern Church, Mary is always represented with her son Jesus. Now, I want you, uh, before we, we leave each other, I, I want to give you a pocket rosary so that you learn how to pray the rosary. So, so could you distribute this please? Now, the only, it 
it's very, very good. And it's tiny, you can put it in your pocket, but of course you need to have a rosary. And of course everything we pray with uh, preferably needs to be blessed. So next Thursday when you bring your rosary, you will bless them and will start, you know, praying slowly but surely the rosary. Unfortunately, I, I had hoped that this evening we could pray the rosary together, but, you know, we're five minutes before nine. So we need to end. But I do encourage you very, very strongly to read this little booklet and to start praying together or on your own the rosary. It's a very beautiful prayer. Make sure that your heart is in your prayer. It's not only your lips and your words. You've got to invest yourself in the prayer. Okay? So, uh, we're going... Do, do we have any left? Yeah. Two? I've got two for them. we got two. Jennifer. Okay. Now, the only thing that has been slightly modified is the Apostles' Creed. There's a new translation, but this is still good. But now we have to learn the new translation, which we say at Mass on Sunday. Um, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, was buried. He descended. The old translation was he descended to the dead. Now he, we say he descended to hell. He went to hell. I still don't know the new translation by heart. I need to read it. So this is very, very good, and it will help you pray. One way of praying is praying the rosary. And you can get, you know, this is, this is one rosary, but I prefer the brown beads. I guess men prefer the brown beads. Women prefer this kind of, uh, and um, it also depends on taste. Uh, okay, so... Let us rise up and pray one last and final prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We thank you, Lord God, for your love for each one of us. That love that today was manifested in telling us about Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of the Lord the mother of God. She is our mother. She's also our sister. And she prays for us. She prays that our hearts will be on fire like those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. She prays that we become holy disciples of her son. So Mary, we entrust this evening our lives to you. Our, the lives of our families, the lives of our loved ones. We ask you to keep praying for us so that as we advance in our CIA, we, we want and we hunger more for Christ, your Son. And we want you to pray for us this evening so that as we return back home, we will return our hearts filled with the joy and peace of your Son. Pray for us so that we can have also a good night's sleep. And to you we say, and through you we say to God, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, and God bless.